Hello friends, this video on principles of inheritance part 44 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. So this was all about the chromosomal disorders and with this we end our discussion on the genetic disorders. So I think we have reached towards the end of this lesson and now it is time for questions. So let us look at some of the questions to see if you have actually understood the lesson well or not. So let us look at the first question. It says a diploid organism is heterozygous for four loci. How many types of gametes can be produced? So now when you say a diploid organism, so what do you infer out of it? So let us try to understand it word by word. So when I say diploid, that means it has got two sets of chromosomes, right? So they will have two sets of chromosomes. So that is what we mean by diploid. Then it says it is heterozygous. That means the two alleles are going to be different. So when I say heterozygous on a particular gene, the allelic pairs are going to be different. So here we can say different alleles for a gene. Then you say for four locus. So what is locus? Locus is nothing but the position on the chromosome. So let us suppose if this is the chromosome. So here it is trying to say that it has four different genes or four different locations on the same chromosome for four traits or for four genes. And they are all heterozygous. That means the corresponding alleles on the other gene are going to be different. So if here it is let us say PQRS, if PQRS are the genes which are located on the four locus of the chromosome, then their corresponding genes on the homologous chromosome is going to be small p, small q, small r and small s because it is heterozygous. And why do we have two two pair? Because it is diploid, so it is going to have two sets of chromosomes. Since it is diploid, so we have two sets of chromosomes. Since it is heterozygous, so they are different capital P, small p, capital Q, small q. Since it has four lo lo locus, that is why it has four genes on the or four locations on the same chromosome. That is four contrasting characters or four genes, whatever you call it. Right? So now we have to find out how many types of gametes can be produced out of it. So basically, what do we have? We have an organism or we have an organism with four contrasting traits like this. Correct? Okay. So now, what are the various combinations possible? Now, you remember when I used to talk about a dihybrid cross, a quick recap. So when I used to talk about a dihybrid cross, what I used to say? In dihybrid cross, we consider two contrasting traits. Correct? So when we consider two contrasting traits, each gamut, every gamut should have one letter representing each trait. For example, if we are talking about a seed and we are considering two traits, that is the shape of the seed and the color of the seed, then each gamut should have one letter representing the shape of the seed and one letter representing the color of the seed. So if I say RY, that means it is a round seed which is yellow in color. If I say R capital Y, I mean it is a wrinkled seed which is yellow in color. If I say RY, I mean it is a wrinkled seed which is green in color. So basically the number of traits which you are considering, for each trait you should have one representative in a gamut. So in this case, your gamut will have how many letters? Because here you have four traits, right? You actually are considering four contrasting traits. So each gamut should have four letters, each letter representing each trait, right? So how many such four letters can you create out of this? For example, this is one possibility. Similarly, this, this can be one possibility. So these are the two extreme possibilities. There can be many possibilities where P is capital, Q is small, R is small, S is small. So that means you can actually find out many combinations. Now, how do you know that how many combinations can you find out? Because if you actually start finding out all the com combination manually, it is going to take a lot of time. So, how do you know how many combinations will be possible? Now, it is very simple. We will use the simple combination technique. So, we know that it will be a four, each gamut will be a four letter word, right? Now, this first position can be taken up by how many values? Small p, capital P. So, two possible values. The second position Q can be taken up by how many values? 
two possible values. Third position R can be taken up by how many values? Two possible values. Similarly, S can be taken up by two possible values. Now you multiply all of them. How much do you get? Two into two into two into two. That is sixteen. So this sixteen is the total number of possible combinations. That means total you can have sixteen such combinations out of this. That means sixteen gametes are possible out of this diploid organism, which is heterozygous for four contrasting traits. Now, if you want to verify this, just try it out for uh, an organism with two contrasting traits. So something like this. So if you consider an organism with two contrasting traits, let us suppose we consider this one, the dihybrid cross scenario, right? So in this case, each gamut will should have two letters like this. So this R can take how many values? It can take two values, capital R and small r. Y can take how many values? Two values, small y and capital y. So multiply them. So how many? Did, how much do you get? Four. So four gametes are possible in this scenario. Now these sixteen gametes or these four gametes are possible only if they follow the principle of independent assortment. So only in that case this will be true. So many people often find it out with the formula. So if you actually see this formula is nothing but two to the power n, where n is the number of contrasting traits. So you can use that formula as well. But this will apply only in case of independent assortment. In case there is linkage, if linkage comes into picture, then the number of gametes will reduce. Because whenever there is linkage, the the two genes will become linked and they will always get inherited together. So your number of combinations will reduce and therefore the number of gametes will reduce. So this sixteen gametes are would be possible only in case of independent assortment. Right? So I hope this concept is clear. So please do not memorize the formula 2 to the power n just for the heck of it. Try to understand how this is happening. And this is the actual logic that how you get to know that how many gametes will be produced. Let us look at question number 2. Let us look at question number 2. It says define and design a test cross. So how do we define a test cross first of all? Now, I have mentioned this before also that test cross is nothing but cross between an individual with an unknown genotype with a homozygous recessive parent. Now, what happens? Now, when you get the output of this cross, that can tell you whether the unknown genotype was heterozygous or this was homozygous. So, how do you know that? If the progeny is 50% dominant and 50% recessive, that means the genotype, unknown genotype is heterozygous. That's because the heterozygous will have both the traits. One will be dominant, one will be recessive. So one trait will remain hidden, right? Which get expressed in the next generation. In the test cross, it gets expressed in the ratio of 50-50. But if the progeny is all 100% dominant, that means the unknown genotype is homozygous. So let us try to perform a test cross and see if it turns out to be true. So let us suppose in the first case, we assume that the, this is the unknown genotype, which we now know is a heterozygous. So we are just trying to see if we get a 50-50 uh, dominant recessive output. So this will be crossed with the homozygous recessive. So what are the gametes that will be formed from here? Capital T, small t and here you will get only small t's. So these are the various possible combinations in this case. Right? So what will be the possible offsprings or possible outcomes of this cross? So this is the possible output. So in this case, this is going to be dominant, right? These are going to be tall. So let us suppose we have taken tall and dwarf as the traits and this is going to be dwarf. Right? So if you see uh, in the output, 50% of them are tall and 50% of them are dwarf. So 50% dominant and 50% recessive. So this shows that the unknown genotype is heterozygous. Now let us look, perform the second scenario where we take the unknown genotype as homozygous. So if the unknown genotype is homozygous, it can produce capital T gamut and this will produce small t. So in that case, the possible of outcomes out of these combinations would be all heterozygous but at the same time all of them are heterozygous but all of these are 
at all. So you actually get the output as 100% dominant. So we know that the unknown genotype is homozygous. So this is how a test cross is designed and this is a test cross. This is what we infer for a test cross. That is why the name is test cross because it is used to test if the unknown genotype is homozygous or heterozygous. Thank you. Please visit www.examclear.com to watch more videos, attempt free online test, get free study material, find tutors and mentors. Thank you once again.